uh, night. I, yeah. I don't know. It is uh, 6 p.m. there? Yes. Yes. Okay, so. Six. Okay. What do you think, Michele? We can start officially? Uh, well, we are so forking the, the class. Just... Maybe two minutes is fine. Just uh, I think uh, all minutes, the students okay. are uh, are joining us. Yeah. How many students, Michele, do we have here? Ninety. Here in the class, uh, there are we are four. 54. So I guess uh, half of the class, uh, they are finishing maybe in the atelier. We have sent, uh, we have texted them to, to join, but I think uh, now the list is, uh, is uh, enlarging. I guess two minutes we can start. Yes, yes. And I, I saw that there are a lot from China. Yeah. And yeah. from Ch other countries. We have 50. In different uh, nationalities, so a lot of uh, Chinese students, many from uh, India and uh, with Southeast uh, countries, and, and uh, well, uh, some Italians for sure, not very much, not very ma not many, and uh, from other countries all over the world, some uh, from Africa and uh, South America. It's, it's a worldwide uh, workshop. Perfect. Excellent. Very interesting. Also, the, the teachers, because uh, we have uh, the atelier are led by three architect professors. One, Lina, is from Italy. They are also connected, I guess. We have uh, Karim Nader, who is a Lebanese architect from uh, Beirut. And Pedro Campos Costa, who is uh, a Portuguese architect from Lisbon. And you can see also in the in the panel, uh, Professor Dirk Juncker and Professor um, Juan Carlos Rojas Arias. I guess uh, you can also say hello because we want to test also your mic. It was not working in the morning. Juan Carlos, can you hear us? Hi. My... Okay. Can you listen to me? <laughs> yeah, Hi. we can. Yeah. Hi. Great. Hello, everybody. Hello. Nice and also nice from Brazil, Fabiano Lemes, ah, yeah. our colleague in Politecnico di Milano. He I works a lot on SDGs. Ah, he's, Ita so. he's Italian, okay. <laughs> I'm now a bit Italian. <laughs> Italian. And he works a lot on SDGs, uh, so I hope that we can share also his methodology with Rafa and um, Metro Hub initiative very soon. I'm looking forward to the session today. In terms of time, uh, how much uh, I will have for the presentation? But we plan uh, almost uh, in total 40 minutes. So you can balance uh, if you would like to have also some question and answer. Uh, I don't know if students are, uh, so today is the first day of the summer school, so uh i don't know if they will be so proactive to make questions probably at the end of the two weeks they will be much more aware about how to use sdgs but in total i guess 40 minutes i don't know michele if it's uh, if it's right yeah yeah it's uh, yeah it's it's perfect i think we can uh, yes well, yes yeah. I will try to to take uh, 30 minutes for the presentation and maybe leave 10 minutes at the end for questions and answers. I hope I hope participants are not tired because I know that you started uh, early today, so uh, I hope to be as, as much as dynamic as possible. Uh, <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Okay, I think uh, Sarah, we can start. We are uh, more than 17 in the class, so we can, I, I guess we can officially start with uh, our first lecture. Okay, uh, I would like uh, just very quickly uh, to welcome uh, Rafa Forero uh, tonight here 
in this virtual space, which belongs to Politecnico di Milano, but especially to Piacenza campus, where we are uh, holding a master program in uh, sustainable architectural landscape design. And we are now, we are starting, this is the introduction lecture, we are starting a summer school uh, where the contribution by uh, Rafa uh, Forero is uh, very crucial, as I mentioned in the morning, because somehow he provides us with a, a kind of a cultural and ethical frame for defining strategies and uh, design proposal for uh, different sites uh, within a very specific and uh, local context, uh, the Piacenza uh, areas in between uh, infrastructures and uh, not sold uh, areas uh, between the old part of the city and uh, the river. Uh, so somehow I think uh, uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to listen to this uh, contribution and uh, I ask now Antonella Contin uh, who organized this contact which is so crucial for this edition of the summer school to introduce uh, uh, Rafa to all the students. Thank you, Antonella. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Sara. Thank you very much to all my colleagues uh, and, uh, in particular, Michele to to organize the, uh, this uh, this uh, event this night. For me, it's a pleasure to 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 host uh, in the space uh, of Piacenza Campus uh, the intervention of uh, Rafa Forero as representative of a Metro Hub uh, initiative. Um, uh, we started with uh, uh, Rafael Forero uh, a long, uh, um, uh, we, we joined together a lot of initiative, a workshop, a seminar uh, in, in different part of the, of the world uh, trying to spread the idea that it's possible to Territorialized uh, SDGs. Uh, the mission of uh, Metro Hub is to uh, try to support the metropolitanization of the um, city uh, in, in different parts uh, of the globe, trying to um, uh, try to demonstrate that it's possible to. Um, uh, be part of this process of uh, decision making, uh, even though right now we are speaking uh, of cities that uh, are incommensurably huge and uh, that seem so far away from the need of the person, of the citizen, of the different citizen, fragile citizen that right now lives. Uh, in live in uh, in that uh, metropolitan territory, I I I could introduce uh, uh, Rafa Forero using uh, his CV, but uh, from my point of view, uh, what is really relevant in the competence of uh, uh, Rafa Forero is the fact that uh, he's an engineer and in particular a complex system engineer. That is quite strange, you know, for an architect like me, so old fashioned to, to, to work with an engineer that is dealing with complex system. But uh, as we said this morning, the metropolis is a complex system and uh, his competence and his expertise is particularly relevant when we have to deal with uh, an exponential phenomena that is dealing with critical factors such as the metropolitan explosive growth. So uh, for me, the, the fact that we start to work with uh, Rafa Forero during a lot of uh, architectural and urban design workshop demonstrate how is possible, is, in, uh, is a fundamental for the metropolitan discipline or better for the practice of metropolitan discipline 
to merge, to, to include a lot of new disciplines uh, that uh, allow us to share knowledge, uh, trying to depackage the complexity of, this, of the urban fact or urban phenomena uh, right now. So I don't want you to uh, uh, spend a, a lot of time presenting uh, uh, Rafa Forero and the One Habitat uh, Initiative. I only would like to say uh, to our student today and our colleague that we would like to um, uh, at the end of the summer school, uh, prepare a report uh, for one habitat that we will share with one habitat. So, uh, to demonstrate uh, how uh, Piacenza Campus was able to interpret uh, that idea of how it's possible to ter territorialize SDGs using also our um, uh, competencies uh, as architect, uh, as urban designer. So, please. Uh, uh, that is a um, call to action for our students. Uh, try to understand how it's possible to work uh, with this uh, tool, with SDGs and new urban agenda, so that we could demonstrate that it's possible also for our discipline to be part of the construction, of the co-construction of the new metropolitan dimension. So I leave the floor to uh, Rafa Forero. Thank you very much uh, to be to join us, uh, and thank you very much to One Habitat Metro Hub uh, Initiative to join us uh, and uh, co-construct with us uh, this uh, new uh, field of action. Thank you very much. Thank you, Antonella. Uh, very happy to be here. Uh, good afternoon again to all of you, and thank you for, for being connected uh, in behalf of Young Habitat. Let me to, to congratulate you first to the Polimi for this interesting uh, workshop and summer school, uh, but also uh, to thank you for, for allowing us to participate, uh, because we definitely think that a partnership with the universities is the only way to, to approach to the territory and to really uh, achieve uh, changes and, and, and address all these sustainable development challenges. Uh, because uh, let me be clear, although we have uh, projects and offices in more than 50 countries and more than uh, 500 cities, uh, we realize that uh, the territorial challenges are being faster out, uh, of the world uh, of our capacities. So. Uh, we definitely can uh, cannot uh, make a change alone. Uh, we definitely need partners, and we see in these capacity building programs and these capacity building strategies uh, a, a very important way to do it. Uh, so actually, uh, capacity building is one of the main important focus of our of our new strategic uh, and global plan. So. Uh, thank you again. Thank you also for that introduction, Antonella. And uh, I, I also not uh, taking uh, much time in this in this opening. I have I know that I have a difficult role today because I am going to take the the opening session, the opening lecture, and I hope to to do my best and and to be uh, dynamic as possible. Uh, let me to 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 warning you because uh, today. I, I will say some some things that uh, could be polemic, but I think that that is the idea. I want to encourage the, the debate and also present some evidence and some recent data mm -hmm. that we have from, from the agency. Uh, so I will start to share my screen and please confirm if you are seeing uh, my presentation. Yes, it's OK. Okay, perfect. So um, we, or I, I have called the the name of this uh, lecture as territorializing SDGs in metropolises, and of course uh, taking the the title of you of you had for the for the summer school, which is towards a more just, green and healthy future, and and that is also a very interesting 
a title because it co it uh, corresponds with uh, one of our most uh, recent reports that uh, we will talk about later. So uh, let me let me start. Uh, I, I I will share with you today four important points, and this is the first one. Uh, the first one is sustainable development challenge are of course global, but also they are metropolitan. And let me to elaborate in that statement. Uh, we, of course, all know that we are uh, uh, living in a in a urban world uh, today. Uh, more than the 50% of the urban population live in cities. We uh, we see this this figure and these numbers uh, all the days. Uh, exactly, the 56% of the of the global population is living in cities, which is uh, about uh, four billion people, uh, which is uh, of course a considerable number. But the, the main question is how this will be in the future and, and mainly how will this be at the end of the century? Uh, how many people will, will be living in cities uh, or where will be living uh, uh, these people at the end of the century? And also how will be those cities? Because of course we know today uh, how many cities we have, but we don't know in, the, in all cases how are those cities? So we we are starting to to to, un, uh, to to answer those questions and also to exploring some projections on how will be the global population and at the end of the century of the century. And there are some uh, initial hints that tell us that at the end of the century we will be at least 10 billion people. The, the global population will stabilize in 10 billion people approximately. And in that age year and in that time, the 90% of that 10 billion people will be urban. So we will have at the end of the century, we think this is a hint, of course, a projection, but we think that we will have at least the double of the urban population of today. So you can start to imagine the challenge of having the double of the urban population in cities and in metropolis in the near future in the common decades. And of course, if we are saying that the, the mainly of the most of the global population is living in cities, we need to realize that there is a strong relation between cities and sustainable development. Uh, and this is not this is not trivial, uh, but it is a relation that, that you need to explore and to start to to understand. And for instance, you can uh, take the uh, SDG 11, which is the one related to sustainable cities and communities, and you can explore in all the, the different targets of the SDG 11, different relations with another relevant targets in another SDG. So uh, a first picture tells us that the cities and that the sustainable urban development is related with almost all the different sustainable development goals. Uh, and, and this is not, uh, this is not difficult to understand. We, we have here some uh, interesting relationships with, for instance, the SDG 11, which is about uh, the SDG 1, which is about uh, no poverty, or the SDG 2, which is about uh, zero hunger, or, or with gender equality, clean water and sanitation. And of course, you can start to, 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 to think that uh, we will not achieve ex effective climate change, for instance, if we do not improve uh, transport systems in cities uh, or, or to protect and safeguard natural heritage. Uh, and of course, for instance, we will not achieve sustainable cities if we do not pursue uh, the idea that all people have the same rights to economic resources, for instance, or access to basic services or ownership of land and, on, and, and other uh, goods which are related to SDGs 1, 6, uh, 2, 7, 12, 8, and, and so on. So uh, in short, we know that if we, if we do not care for sustainable cities, uh, maybe we will not achieve a sustainable development as a whole. So we we need to start uh, to, to exploring and to find uh, how are the cities today? And the, and the first result that we get in exploring that is that the urban world is really becoming a metropolitan one. So uh, we live in a urban world, of course, as I said at the beginning, but this urban world is mainly metropolitan. 
and you have this the uh, you have here the the map uh, in the world where, where are and which are the the principal metropolises of the world uh, all the the blue dots that you see in the map are uh, corresponding with metropolises uh, and of course of different sizes you can see in the map uh, metropolises uh, the, the common metropolises or the common idea that we had in the past on metropolis which are a large and big metropolises, or as we call it today, the mega cities, uh, which are uh, cities uh, with more than 10 million inhabitants. But of course, we have another size metropolis in the world, which are actually actually the main group. Uh, you can see in the map that the, the most of the points correspond with metropolis to uh, 300,000 to 1 million inhabitants, and, and on other group of metropolis, which is 1 million to 5 million inhabitants. So the world is becoming a metropolitan world, the, the urban world is becoming metropolitan, but also uh, a diverse, uh, a complex uh, size metropolis as well. Uh, of course, you can see as, as, as usual and as, as we know it before that uh, all uh, the majority of this metropolisation process uh, is taking place uh, the, or, or uh, took place uh, at the beginning at uh, regions as Europe and North America and some part of Asia. And today they are uh, increasing uh, in, in regions as South America, Africa and, and, and other parts of Asia. When, when you see this uh, proportion in, 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 your, in, in continents by, by regional prominence, you can see, uh, of course, that Asia Pacific is leading this growth because the 56% uh, the of the metropolitan population is located in, in Asia Pacific. And of course, the region account for more than 1000 metropolis. In total, let me let me to, to go back here because I, I don't say something important. In total, you have here almost 2000 metropolis. 1934 metropolises around the world uh, in total but uh, you can see that asia pacific had m uh, most of the half of them 1038 metropolises and the other regions uh, are more similar in terms of metropolitan populations and number of metropolis for instance you can see in the in the graphic you can see a similarity between Africa and Latin America, both in metropolitan population and in the number of metropolis. For instance, in the number of metropolis, Africa has the 255 metropolis, uh, while Latin America and the Caribbean 215, very similar numbers. Uh, and also uh, Western Europe and other states, and let me to clarify this because we, we here are using the, the regional grouping of the United Nations, which not necessarily correspond to the geographical continents, but to the distribution of the UN General Assembly. For instance, you have one group for Africa, one group for Latin America. In Europe, you have divided in two, in two principal groups, one for Eastern Europe and another for Western Europe and other states. And those other states, are, we will uh, see this in more detail uh, after, but these other states correspond with in North America and Australia, because this distribution is more related with socioeconomical and political conditions than with geographical, of course. And you have uh, another group for Asia and Pacific uh, without Australia. So, uh, but this is uh, almost the, the general distribution of this metropolitan group, uh, metropolitan growth uh, about the uh, around the world, no? And this is not only the situation for today, but this will be also the situation for the future. Our, our most recent projections tell us that the metropolitan population will be continue growing and rapidly. For instance, in, in net numbers today, we, we have a, at least 2.6 billion people living in metropolis. Remember the, the numbers that I I give I give at the at the beginning of the presentation. The six the 56 percent of the global population, which is about four billion uh, people, is living in cities. Uh, a turn within that four billion people, 2.6 are living in metropolitan areas, in metropolises, in urban agglomeration. This is almost the 60 percent of the urban population or a third of humanity. So a 
third of humanity is living today in metropolises. But in the next 15 years, more than 1 billion additional people will live in this kind of cities. So uh, this, this uh, comes to us in a, in a general idea or in a general insight, which is uh, metropolises are becoming the most common typology of cities of human settlements in the 21st century. You can see there in the, in the graphic of the right, the, the proportions in the next 15 years, for instance, Metropolitan cities in the in 2035 will represent almost the 40 percent of the global population. That is is a much larger than the other uh, the population living in all, in other kind of cities. Uh, let's say in no agglomerated cities, a small cities and towns, which will correspond to 23.5 percent. So these this, these are not uh, small numbers. I mean, uh, we definitely can, uh, from evidence, uh, can uh, respond this, uh, this, this statement that uh, metropolises are the main uh, typology of cities in the, in the 21st century. And of course, we are starting to think how to approach metropolitan dynamics from SDGs. And this is a work that we started with Antonella and with the Polymi, Polymi team uh, I think two years ago, uh, before the pandemic, we started to, to analyze uh, SDGs, the different goals, the different targets of the SDGs, and try to extract, a, 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 we, we call it keywords and related concepts, which are, uh, I think, the philosophy, the essence uh, between SDGs, between the targets, and try to, to shape some metropolitan realities and and dynamics from those SDGs. You have there some, some uh, or, or a couple of, of examples, for instance, from SDG 1. Uh, of course, we can, we can extract uh, poverty as the key word and some related concepts uh, as extreme poverty, social protection, economic resources, basic services, resilient, and try to, to shape some uh, or to represent some territorial realities through those related concepts and keywords in order to have a more uh, general or abstract or mapping idea and how to link these sustainable development goals and the challenges that territories and that metropolises. Uh, I, I am not to, to take uh, much time to explain this, but you can, of course, access to, the, to this uh, handbook, a uh, handbook, and these articles in the link that I put in the presentation. I, I suppose that you will have access to this presentation before, and you can, uh, of course, refer to all the resources that I will that I will show you uh, through. I will advance in the presentation. So that was my first point. Uh, the, 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 of course, the development challenges are global, but also are metropolitan. So the second point is we live in a world of small, small and intermediate. Metropolises. And I think that uh, we can start to, to be polemic here. Uh, and to, to start to, to understand uh, what are referring as metropolis, we, we have to, to understand metropolis from the geography, reality, from the, from the territory. Uh, what is the metropolis of the 21st century and what is the difference between the metropolis of the century and the metropolis of the past? And as I said before, uh, in the past, uh, when we uh, hear about metropolis, we uh, mainly imagine uh, big cities and large cities. But, but really, today, uh, we can say that metropolis are referring not to a population numbers, not to a political geography, but to a functional geography. So, uh, of course, uh, there are uh, several ways and concepts to understand metropolises around the world, and they also depend on legal, cultural, uh, administrative, economic context. But uh, we, we can have like a general agreement saying that metropolises are cities, of course, but cities that are related to the, this uh, proximity or these surroundings that we call the commuting zone. Uh, which is, uh, of course, suburban, periurban, and rural territories around the city uh, that are connected. 
that have some kind of territorial interdependencies. Uh, uh, these the interdependencies, these linkages can be economic, can be social, or can be, of course, environmental. But uh, the, the general characteristic of the metropolis of the 21st century is, is that are connecting uh, connected cities. Uh, so uh, this is uh, the map that you saw this morning, the, the metropolis of Milan and all the surrounding, uh, for instance, Piacenza, Parma, uh, and, and so on. And you can, of course, uh, start to, to extract some linkages between the territory. We can see also this uh, maybe more clearly in these political uh, maps. Uh, this is a reality that happened in, in all the world. We can see uh, here three examples, three different examples uh, of, of on the functional geography of the metropolis. First one, we have a metropolis in Colombia, which is uh, Bucaramanga, the metropolitan area of Bucaramanga, which is a small metropolis, 1.2 million people. Uh, and you can see that the territory, the urban territory, uh, surpasses the, the political uh, local boundary. And, and that is the, the main characteristic of the metropolis. We call it this statistically at the city proper, the center of the city, the most local division, which is the, the yellow territory in the maps. That is the city proper. And uh, one characteristic of the functional geography of this metropolis is that all metropolises already surpass that city proper. Uh, you can see it in Delhi, for instance, a mega city, approximately uh, 30 million people. Uh, but you, you can see it also, for instance, in Port Elizabeth in South Africa, another small metropolis, uh, about 1.5 million people. All those different size metropolis have the, the same territorial uh, and geographic characteristic, which is that the, uh, the, the territorial dynamics surpasses the city proper, the more local administrative division. So definitely uh, we from Green Habitat uh, are trying to like to, to, to promote this insight of we need to change uh, from a political geography to a functional geography. We need really uh, to, to stop to understand cities on, on how they were divided in the past and to start to understand this and how they can be used in the future because at the end citizens don't care how cities are divided but they care how they can be used them and how cities can of course uh, offer opportunities and development and quality uh, life uh, con context so um so uh, uh, leaving, leaving the definitions behind let's say let, let's explore some more detailed numbers so we have done uh, all from almost 2000 metropolis only 85 in the world are big or large cities which are the red dots in the map you can see uh, the red dots correspond with a metropolis with 10 million or more which has a, a, a total of 34 today and then you have the orange dots which correspond to metropolis of 5 to 10 million of inhabitants which has a, about a 50 or so on in, in total you have only 85 metropolises with more than 5 million people the rest of the almost 2000 metropolises are really small metropolises so uh, in the opposite that we uh, think uh, the, or, or we thought in the past, the war is is not becoming a war of of big cities, uh, and and this is polemic because this is an idea that we use it to to hear that, that the war is is becoming in a war of a uh, big and large cities. The evidence shows us the opposite. The world is becoming a world of small and intermediate cities and metropolises. And this will be the same in the next year. By 2035, there will arise only 14 new megacities, while 450 other size metropolises. So uh, in, in the 2035, we will have uh, almost 15, uh, 50 megacities, but all the other cities will be small and uh, medium metropolises, and this will be a common characteristic of all regions in the world. 
not only uh, Europe uh, and, and North America and Asia, but all regions in the world will have the same characteristic and the same distribution. Of course, uh, that the war will occur uh, mainly in Asia Pacific, as, and, and I said before, uh, but also Africa and Latin America and the Caribbean are some regions that have some opportunity of, of growth in the, in the next uh, years. Uh, regions as Europe and as North America are almost stabilized in both uh, population growth and also urbanization and metropolitan growth. This is, uh, we, we saw some uh, global trends, uh, but we have now uh, some uh, zooming in, in Western Europe and other states. As you can see in the map uh, what I told you before, that in this group we consider not only uh, Western Europe, but also Canada, USA, and Australia. And this is the, the mainly the general distribution of this group, 325 metropolises, only three metropolises with more than 10 million inhabitants, which are London, New York, and uh, Los Angeles. Uh, then you have uh, 11 metropolis between 5 and 10 million inhabitants, and you have 18 metropolises between 1 and 5 million and 231 metropolises between 300,000 inhabitants and 1 million. Uh, you can see also there the, the countries with more metropolises, which of course means that they are countries that have a polycentric system of cities, which are USA with more than 100 metropolises, almost 150 100 metropolises. And then you have Italy in the second place with, I think, I, I, I hope this will be right, you can correct me at the end, but I think that you have uh, 32 metropolises, then you have a UK with 28 and so on. Um, and at the, at the right of the, of the slide, you can see also the graphs with the, with the population growth and with the metropolitan population growth, the average annual growth in the coming years. And you can see that, of course, the net of the numbers will increase in almost uh, 50 million people in the next 15 years. But the average, the annual average is decreasing and is decreasing fast. Uh, so uh, the, the last uh, between, between um, 2000 and 2020, uh, the, this group have an, uh, an, uh, an, uh, an annual average of growth of 1.25, and in the next 15 years, uh, this will be less than 1%, so uh, 0.77 uh, uh, of annual growth rate in Western Europe and other states. So, of course, in, in, in net numbers, uh, the population is still uh, increasing, but in percentage, uh, it will be decreasing and faster. So this is, of course, an uh, uh, insight or a hint that the, the population growth is stabilizing in the mostly of the world, but uh, of course, mainly in this in this region. So that's what that was my second message or my second point. Uh, the world is becoming a world of intermediate and small metropolises, and not a world of big cities. So. The third message or the, the third point is uh, how metropolises and how can this kind of cities overcome global crisis? And I think uh, that, of course, we, we, we have some hints with the, with the COVID-19 pandemic uh, because we, we realized it and, and we saw that global crises do not recognize political boundaries. So, nor the pandemics, nor the climate change, the migration, the declining of democracy, and neither of those recognize political boundaries. The COVID-19 pandemic advanced uh, without uh, caring for municipal or regional or national boundaries. And of course, one of the most important lessons that we had from the COVID-19 pandemic is that no city and no country uh, can uh, overcome this crisis alone. So, of course, that we need to work together. We need uh, a new governance approaches based on cooperation, on collective action, on of territorial integration to overcome this kind of crisis today. Uh, the pandemic, of course, uh, the, the negative impact of, of the pandemics uh, are decreasing, but for instance, they are uh, increasing another 
a negative impact uh, or another sustainable challenge such as a climate change, for instance. We took, and, and, and to, to try to understand this in, in a more detailed way, we took a sample in nearly of 200 governance arrangements uh, around the world in 80 countries, uh, where local, subnational, and national governments worked together and intervened during the COVID 19 pandemic. And, and the, the principal result of this, of this analysis is that metropolitan governments played a facilitating role serving as a hinge, you know, as a hinge uh, for local governments and some national governments working together. We saw that in those places where metropolitan arrangements were set at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, the, the actions to address the COVID-19 uh, get, uh, get uh, faster to a more uh, extended population and more extended territories. So uh, those cities where metropolises worked together uh, could uh, address in an in a optimus way the pandemic and their negative consequences. All these uh, analysis and all these results are, are published in this report, uh, which I say before correspond to the title of the, of the summer school, Cities and Pandemics towards a more just, green, and healthy future. You can download it for free in the in our web page. There, are, there is the, the link uh, also. You can uh, also refer to, to these materials. And the, the, the important lesson from, from this is that it's different authorities at different territorial scales must recognize the need for more integrated, cooperative, and multi-level governance approaches. Uh, of course, uh, emphasizing on flexible and innovative institutional and financial and planning and legislative frameworks, uh, but uh, uh, of course centered or focused in this uh, notion of working together, of cooperation and of collective uh, action. So this is my, my last point. I hope to don't be boring you. Uh, what are the lessons at the, at the end? What are the lessons for this decade of action uh, for implementing the SDGs? And remember uh, that the, in, in September uh, 2019, the Secretary General of the United Nations called it this uh, last 10 years from 2020 to 2030 as the decade of action to achieve SDG. And these actions uh, means local, national, regional, and global action. So, uh, any of us can contribute to achieve the SDGs. So can, how can we do it? Let's see some lessons from the pandemic and from the recent metropolisation process. The lessons are, are, divide, are 10 and are divided in three uh, main categories. The first one is the governance lessons, which correspond to three different uh, insights or, or ideas. Uh, you can see it there in the, in the slide. The first one is about, of course, cooperation. You know, as I as I say before, no country or city, uh, regardless of its political and social economic context, was able to tackle the crisis alone. So, collective collective action must be at the center. Uh, some some uh, cities try, uh, but the result uh, actually actually they, they try to to overcome the crisis and the pandemic alone resulted in a, in a renaissance of the national sentiments and a diminish of social responsibilities. Uh, and of course, uh, for instance, uh, uh, as the pandemic progresses, more national governments and local authorities understand that they depend not only on their peers, but also on multiple social actors to design uh, and to implement mitigation, adaptation, and reactivation measures. So, uh, although cooperative work took a long time to start, and there are some countries and cities that still do not do it in an efficient way, uh, increasing the negative effects of the pandemic in the territories, definitely, uh, we need to strengthen existing cooperative systems, both globally and locally. 
Uh, and this is, uh, this is also an important lesson for us in the international community because we realize that international cooperation is most urgent that that, uh, that, that, that uh, any time before. So the second lesson is related to participation, and it is about uh, all the all the cycle of participation. Because definitely, with when we talk about participation, consulting is not enough. So the weakening of democracy persisted during the pandemic. Right, the protests and the popular movement continued their work in many metropolises and countries where they had been present even before the pandemic, even the arrival of COVID-19. Uh, but in some cities, new, new protests began due to the impact caused by the restriction uh, imposed for the governments to cook the virus. Uh, so, of course, uh, people is upset. Uh, there are, uh, the, the communities are, are not agreeing with, with uh, mainly of the institutional and formal approaches, and, and we start to analyze why. And we, saw, uh, we saw that, of course, listening and consulting with the discontented population is the first step to addressing this, this concern, but it's not enough. So local, subnational, and national governments must address uh, the needs of the population and reach agreements with all social sectors and include a specific solutions in public policies, in plan, and in projects. Uh, so consulting is not enough, but also contribution is necessary. The third lessons about uh, governance for this decade of action of SDGs is about metropolises. And, and we really think that some approaches to urbanizations could be outdated. When we uh, think and work uh, on global urbanization, some approaches could be uh, outdated. Uh, I mean, COVID-19 shone a light on metropolitan governance as a necessary approach to advance towards sustainable development. So municipal management disconnected from its surroundings uh, that, of course, uh, perhaps was useful at some point in the last century now, today, in this new reality, it looks very outdated. We need local governments that care for working together. Uh, the, the territorial management cannot be only related anymore to municipal management, but we need uh, over more a, a cooperative, a metropolitan, a regional approach. Next group of the lessons, the policy lessons, and these are very interesting as well. And the first one is about inequity. The most affected people are still the same. So women and girls, children and youth, and youth people, the early, the disabled, the poorest people, including those living in slums in, in, in many countries around the world and in, in informal housing, in cities of developing and less developed countries, the general, the most vulnerable communities were the most affected by the multiple crises uh, unleashed by the pandemic. So, uh, for instance, violence against women and girls uh, increased during the long quarantines, but also children and youth without internet access were unable to continue uh, studying uh, from home. Uh, of course, uh, this is also applying for rural and disconnected community where the economic uh, sustainability were, uh, were uh, putting in an in a edge from the pandemic. So um, actually all these uh, affections in the, in the more vulnerable uh, population of the world caused a setback in the partial achievements uh, of the of the SDGs reached before the pandemic. So uh, even the some some uh, UN reports uh, calculate this setback in two or three decades in some specific topics as education, poverty, and health. So definitely we need care about uh, the the most affected people, the most vulnerable population. So. Uh, COVID-19 showed that it is urgent to put greater emphasis on reducing socioeconomic inequalities around the world. 
if we want to be more sustainable societies, of course. Uh, and we in the international community uh, most definitely find formulas to a more equitable distribution of wealth and economic resources. The next lesson about the fifth, about prosperity. We need multidimensional visions for urban development. So uh, go, uh, at this point, uh, after the pandemic uh, or in the last uh, stage of the pandemic, governments of all levels are reviewing their medium and long-term development vision because, because the negative effects of COVID-19. So uh, international organizations, UN, OECD, uh, and others uh, have been emphatic in highlighting that those visions, those new development visions, most, most mainstreaming principles uh, including in the global development agendas. For instance, solidarity, responsibility, cooperation, and collective action. And of course, we need also a multidimensional visions of prosperity, not only economic prosperity, as, as prosperity was also understood in the past, but also multidimensional visions that care about uh, environment, uh, that care about quality of life, that care about planning principles and so on. So we need multidimensional visions. Uh, the next one, digitalization. Definitely, this is, this is very interesting for me because uh, we found that on digitalization, we should definitely be cautious. So, um, of course, that COVID-19 means a new impetus for the digital revolution uh, at that metropolitan, local, national authority use the virtuality as a new reality. But the reality is that millions of people in different parts of the world could not achieve or could not access to those uh, digital means because actually uh, children and, and young people do not continue their classes, companies went to bankrupt and people lose their incomes due uh, to, to not being able to access remote work modalities and some public services or even were suspended because not all cities were prepared to address this new digital revolution. So in, in the post pandemic, uh, we need to assure that digitalization is a gradual and equitable change, reducing the digital divide in the territories, especially in less development countries and developing countries, and in general, avoiding a repeat of the Industrial Revolution, because the Industrial Revolution was the last revolution that left millions of people behind. So we need to avoid that that comes to this new, new digital revolution. If we do not manage this revolution in a good way, maybe also we will be leaving also millions of people behind. Uh, the last lesson of this group, the uh, recovery, metropolises will change the future. Uh, definitely, uh, and, and you may be here these all days that cities and local governments are in the front line of the response to the COVID-19. Uh, and of course, they, they have had the highest number of positive cases and the highest uh, negative impacts. Uh, but uh, it is also well known that metropolis are engine of productivity, productivity uh, attracting thousands of people searching for new opportunities. So their accumulation of social capital makes the metropolis engines in engines to generate uh, ideas, knowledge, and innovation. So when well managed, can accelerate the production of sustainability solutions. If we uh, learn to manage in a good way all the, the inputs that Metropolis has offered to us, we can definitely find hubs of sustainable development in, in those kind of cities. Uh, so in, in this sense, I like it a lot to, to promote and to recover uh, this, this idea of Antonella on a new metropolitan discipline, uh, but definitely uh, a new discipline that, that understands cities from the linkages and the interdependences with the surroundings 
and that a discipline that train urban practitioners and decision makers around these principles is definitely essential for an effective recovery uh, that allows us to build back better, uh, but also to shape healthier, greener, and fair urban futures, right? And the last, the last slide, and I promise you that I finish here, uh, are the more SDG-related uh, lessons, which are also three. Uh, the first one is about SDG territorialization, the, the, the subject that brings us together today. So, subnational levels are key for advancing for advancing uh, sustainability. So. Uh, we saw it before, right, with the data and with the numbers. Metropolises are becoming the most representative type of city of the 21st century, uh, to the extent that they concentrate more of the global population and one third of humanity. Uh, so we need, of course, uh, or, or we know, of course, that the quality of life of many million of people is, is depending of a proper metropolitan and regional management. So this becoming a particular evident during the pandemic, uh, because restriction of the flow of people's goods, services through the urban rural continuum put entire regions in, in the edge, in a bind. Uh, many uh, people could not access to food or to, to provisions or to the uh, regional and country and global economic markets to for for uh, avoiding these flows between cities and metropolises and their surrounding. So we need to review medium and long term development visions for the post pandemic, uh, but also this review sets an ideal scenario for the territorialization and for increasing the profile of subnational and metropolitan governments in a uh, sustainable uh, development. The next one is about the new urban agenda. Maybe you have heard before about the new urban agenda. The new urban agenda is mainly about city diplomacy. And the lesson here is that city diplomacy is key for the future of multilateralism. Uh, of course, that direct cooperation between cities, the exchange of knowledge and lessons and feedback on, on urban policy implementation were very useful uh, during the pandemic. Uh, but, all, but also the articulation with other levels of government, uh, including the national level, which is actually the natural uh, level for multilateralism and, and for international uh, cooperation. But we know that traditional multilateral organizations should include international network of cities, international networks of subnational governments in global decision making. A scenario. This, this was definitely a lesson learned from the pandemic. Uh, cities working together around the globe uh, are maybe sometimes more efficient than countries working together. Okay. Uh, and the new, uh, the, the last uh, lessons is about COVID 19 and about uh, the global impact of, of COVID 19. And, and this is the global pandemic, is of course. A uh, uh, very worrying crisis, but it is just a first call for action. So, uh, world leaders are, are, are urgently calling for a new social contract uh, from the pandemic and a new global deal for a new era. So, uh, we need whole of society and whole of government approaches becoming fundamental conditions for achieving those changes and, do, and those new social and global deals. Uh, so if we do not get a COVID-19 pandemic as a proof that our current development models are unsustainable and require urgent structural changes, then we will not have learned anything from this first warning call at all. Uh, so I think that does that uh, this was uh, my my uh, four points. I hope you are still uh, here, and I hope uh, Tom uh, being boring you with this intervention. I uh, get back 
de, de Talk and de, de Flor, tu Antonella, tu Sara, and to another participants for. I, I think that more for a questions and answer. Uh, I would like also to hear your, your opinions, your insight. Maybe you can say me, no, this is totally wrong. I don't think that the war is becoming urban or metropolitan. I don't think that we need new approaches for, for cooperation and for governance. Maybe to share your, your insights uh, and your reactions to these four points. Uh, but of course, if you have some questions, I can also try to, to address them. Over to you, Antonella. Thank you very much, uh, Rafa, for this uh, very vast uh, overview regarding Metro Hub Initiative and UN Habitat uh, uh, activity. Uh, as you can imagine, I have a lot of reaction and question, uh, but uh, I really would like that to leave the floor to my colleagues uh, and uh, in particular the, the, the colleagues that are dealing with SDGs with their students and during in their courses and uh, uh, also uh, leave the floor uh, for the student that would like to understand uh, better uh, some issue and some questions that you uh, present. So, uh, I don't know if um, Michele already have uh, recollect some uh, comment or question or if uh, my colleagues would like to uh, open the dialogue with, uh, with you. There is a hand. Uh by Fabiano, I guess. Perfect. Thank you, Fabiano. Thank you, Antonella. Thank you very much, uh, Rafael, for your very interesting talk. Um, I've got well, a, a few um, thoughts that I'd like to um, hear your opinion on, <clears throat> and our voice is failing, you know, and uh, they will probably end up with a question uh, each. Um, the first one is regarding the very definition, you know, and, and you pose at the beginning how difficult it is to define a metropolis. You now, what is a metropolis? What is a metropolitan region? Um, so the Eurostat talks about city, greater city, functional urban areas, and so on. And it, it's, it, it strikes me that, in a way, to talk about a small metropolis in a traditional sense, it's almost like an oxymoron, you know, because the very idea of the metropolis appears in planning as the great city, you know, and all the um, joys and the troubles that the great city puts to us. Um, and it seems to me um, that the metropolis or the bigness uh, within the definition seems to be going elsewhere to other definitions, you know, like the mega city, mega region, and so on. Um, so I. Um, was wondering, you know, if we um, take a loose definition of metropolis in the sense that um, um, we live in a world that is uh, more and more interconnected. So um, it's very difficult, in fact, to find uh, a town that is not really connected to a main city. Um, if we start then calling everything a metropolis, um, I mean, if there is a risk, that the question is essentially if you think that there might be a risk that then we start calling everything a metropolis and therefore losing the very precision in the definition of, uh, of the term. Or do we need uh, another term? Do we need to think more precisely about what a metropolis is and uh, perhaps as opposed to its metropolitan region? So that's the first one. Um, so the second one is uh, also again on the on the question of metropolis and the item seven of the list, then the metropolis will change the future. And I was wondering um, if you have any thoughts on how COVID and the potential dispersion of the population into rural and suburban areas may potentially challenge that, uh, or at least give a different tone uh, to what to what. Um, that uh, role of the metropolis may, may be. Um, and then on that as well, I was also thinking about whether, or not whether, but also on how we can ensure that um, we don't lose the other scales. You know? um, so ensuring that um, 
we uh, are talking at cross scale interactions that go also beyond the metropolitan regions, you know, the regional, um, the national, etc. Uh, so if I focus or, or perhaps uh, uh, too centered focus on the idea of the metropolis may potentially challenge uh, cross scale interactions that go beyond the metropolis. Um, well, some, some, some initial uh, reflections. Thank you. Wow. No, if, if we can take uh, a couple of, of reactions more and then I can reply to all of them at the end. I think that there is uh, Sara Protasoni that writes uh, her hand. Okay. Uh, thank you for your very inspiring uh, contribution. Uh, I bring here uh, questions and doubts but that are very personal and are very strong in uh, this period uh, immediately after the pandemics uh, in relation to the big uh, frame that you have brought here today and I would like really to, to, to hear what uh, what is your possible answer to these doubts uh, where I really have problems to find an answer. Uh, so, for sure, the metropolitan approach uh, uh, is based uh, and it's something, it is happening and we have to start to, to learn. Uh, and for sure, all what it is uh, defined within uh, the keyword of the SDGs, uh, it is something that it is now ethically leading our work as architects in relation with, with what is going on in the reality. And uh, I also think uh, that the lessons you have brought us today are very intriguing, but I have two main doubts. The, main, the, the first one is uh, somehow the SDGs uh, are defined on a global level and somehow at the end uh, they uh, pertain more to the, the ethical dimension of uh, our work and the structural condition of our work are, of course, so different that somehow it requires a big effort to us to understand uh, what could be uh, uh, obtained or what not in relation with the, the specific local condition. Uh, so my first question is, in which way you deal with the fact that immediately the definition of the SDGs uh, and these ethical goals somehow requires uh, a work which is also ending in something that I would define as a political work, which means uh, which actions uh, are uh, necessary to be performed uh, to reach the goal in relation to the structural condition and to also the, as you say, uh, uh, legal condition and administrative condition. So the first question is the political actions. What is the relation? I'm sorry, maybe it looks a little bit naive, but it's something I, I would like to reflect about. Uh, the second question, which became very evident uh, after the pandemic, uh, it is also uh, the question of our technical role within this incredibly large and complex processes. Because once we say that cooperation and participation are two uh, goals that have to be performed to reach uh, the SDGs, immediately we uh, crash with the question that uh, the awareness and the knowledge today are not really shared. And the pandemic is this was very evident. Very often we have had the decision which were defined as technical decisions that we know were not really technical decisions, were really strong political decisions. This is even stronger once we work uh, with uh, the urban structures and we work as architects. So my second question is uh, how you deal with this question of the definition of our technical function within uh, this big uh, processes which is somehow a function which is uh, uh, in, uh, somehow divided between the global awareness of the processes, the local conditions, and which role we can 
uh, really play in, in this. I think in this, uh, probably our workshop will be very interesting because in a way uh, it is uh, something which is starting from the ground to experiment this. But somehow the second question of the uh, technical role of our presence within this process, uh, it is also something I would like to reflect with you about. Thank you. Antonella, Rafa, can we collect also um, a comment by the colleague from the School of uh, Toulouse, Juan Carlos? Juan Carlos, can you can you give us your comment? Because he has written me, but we can try also with him directly. Okay, maybe there is some problem with the mic. Anyway, I can I can read uh, his comment. Uh, also, because it's related with the other uh, comment by one student. So, Juan Carlos uh, uh, was is, is wondering about. Uh, um, he wrote uh, the pandemic has also caused the population to move into less dense areas. Are the data from past from the past projections still relevant, still valid, or we need to 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 to, to work about the new data? Is something also. Um, uh, also, Fabiano was uh, was mentioning, and then we have the first uh, comment by students. So the atelier number three is is winning uh, the award. Di Cheng Yang, I can read uh, the comment. I'm wondering what's the role is related with the previous comment. I'm wondering what's the role of the countryside being playing during the metropolitan. Will countryside in gaining more freedom in independent development or still playing a contributor or sacrificing subject towards city expanding and development? So this question about the rural urban in the metropolitan condition you were mentioning. I guess Rafa, you have a lot of things to say. <laughs> okay. I was thinking in some in some initial points, because I, I am afraid and I have to confess that uh, those are all very difficult questions. Uh, I'm, I'm afraid I don't have answers, but I'm trying to, to, to make some reflections on, on that. Uh, let me start with the more easily one, the data, uh, Juan Carlos, which, which has, uh, is the data still valid or we need to worry new data? This is, uh, we need to, to consider that uh, these are global uh, and long trends. Uh, so urbanization process is not a phenomenon of, of the last five or 10 or 20 years, but of the last at least uh, five centuries or, or so on. Uh, at least, I mean, Antonella will say, no, this is uh, 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 from Roma. Okay, so we, we, we are, uh, we are, uh, uh, speaking about long-term uh, process and long-term trends on human development. So uh, I would like to connect this with with uh, with with Fabiano, uh, right? Uh, how how permanent will be this change of people going from from cities to the very urban or rural territories or small towns? Uh, what we saw in the first wave of the pandemic is that that situation was very common. Uh, many people, uh, and I am talking about thousands uh, and maybe millions of people, uh, were going from cities to the to the countryside. And then, then at the, when people realized that this uh, uh, well, uh, will be a, a reality for at least two or three years, people starting to uh, get back to the cities. So in the first wave, and this was a global process, in the first wave of the pandemic, millions of people went from cities to the rural uh, territories. But in uh, after six months, after eight months, after one year, people started to get back. And, and this is interesting. And, and this, this uh, uh, take us more to the to, to the to, to what is the added value of cities. We we started to think it again of the uh, on the added value of cities. Why people prefer to be uh, let's say agglomerated and, and, and let's say uh, to be exposed to more risks, uh, but but they prefer to be in cities. Why? Because definitely cities are a hub of opportunities. Uh, 
eh, de, de, I, 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 I'd like to, to say something about the, the, the rural uh, life and the disconnection. The, the bad thing is not being rural, but the bad, the bad thing is being disconnected from the opportunities of development. So in Europe, in US, maybe in Canada, uh, there are some cities that can connect their surroundings in a, in a very optimal way. So you can go from the center of the cities to the small town near to the city in 30 minutes or 45 minutes or less than an hour uh, or so on. But in the mostly of, of less development and development of developing countries, this is not possible. You, you take uh, or it's very difficult to access to, to some uh, rural communities and rural territories. The transport is not efficient uh, as in other uh, developed countries and developing regions. So this disconnection presented, and this, dif this is an important difference between the developing and developed world, that the developing is more disconnected and definitely this impact the population dynamics people and, and mostly in developing and less developing uh, countries continue to searching opportunities in cities. And they even and they even prefer uh, be exposed to most risks. And I am not talking about only the pandemic, but of course uh, the violence risks, the discrimination risk in cities that being disconnected in the in the countryside. Uh, so I, I I, I cannot assure uh, how permanent will be this situation, but I can tell you that uh, this reverted in the first months of the pandemic, people get back to cities. And for that reason, I think that we don't need a specific data uh, in this moment. Maybe we need uh, new data in the next two or five years uh, to, to really analyze and to really evaluate how this, uh, this pandemic, when, when we finish it, if really change or not the population dynamics and the urban rural migration dynamics. I suspect that there will be no changes because this already happened in the past. Uh, we have gone through several pandemics in the, even in the recent past and always the change was uh, or, or was to strengthen the city before uh, after the pandemic. So uh, and, and this is also reported in the in the citizen pandemic study that I showed uh, before, uh, how different pandemics in the recent past have strengthened, have evolved, and have changed the cities. And the result uh, were, uh, was always the same, more people going to cities. More people going to cities, even with pandemics and other uh, sustainable challenges. So this can, this can like us or not, but this is the global trend and this is a very long term trend. I am speaking about the trend of decades and even a trend of centuries. Um, however, however, uh, we from the United Nations used to, to revisit this global progression every four years. This data that I showed you before uh, was from the uh, UN Urbanization Prospects uh, from 2018. So in uh, next year, 2022, we will have a, a new set, a new data set of a uh, world urbanization prospects. So uh, we we will check, of course, if this if these numbers and these projections to the next 15 or 20 years will change next year with the new data sets. But I suspect that not that there, there will be not changes or not important changes in that sense, in the sense of more people going to cities and more cities uh, becoming really a metropolises. And let me to reflect also in this, in this definition of metropolises, which was another question from Fabiano. What is the, uh, first for me, it's very difficult to find a proper definition, even from cities. When you, when you ask me, uh, ask to me, where, what is a city, I can really, don't reply to you exactly what is a city, because even there are not uh, global definitions or, or global concepts about what is a city. Uh, so you can find even for cities very diverse and, and different definition based on political, 
legal, economic, and cultural frameworks. So this is the same for metropolises. But I, 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 I like it to, 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 to maybe to overcome some, some common uh, myths, for instance, uh, the myth or, or, of, of treasures. Uh, and this is, this is very polemic because, for instance, uh, in, in the past, uh, in ancient cities, we usually call Roma as a metropolis, but Roma in the ancient history was a city of 300,000 uh, inhabitants. As they as as there are almost two thousand cities today, two thousand metropolis. But with the time, we 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 started to to increase and to increase and to increase that pre, that thresholds. So I I I don't like to to be based on thresholds for 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 defining cities or territories or metropolises. And in that sense. Uh, we are trying to promote a more functional definition, as I presented before. This is not a definition of, of urban population. This is not a definition of territorial extension, nor even a definition based on the local governments or local administrative division within a city or within a metropolis, but it's more a geographical and a territorial definition. We understand metropolises uh, as those cities that have several relations with their surroundings. We, we realize it in UN and in UN Habitat in particular, that we cannot continue understanding cities as isolated islands. We, we need to start to understand cities as connected territories. And we need, at the same time, we need to start to understand the territory as a continuum, not a not to, to promote a continuum, promoting this false dichotomy between the rural and the urban continuum, but try to understand uh, the, the, the territory as a continuum. Uh, in that sense, for instance, also, uh, we need to realize that more of the more precious resources of cities come from the rural side. For instance, water, air, food, all of those, the majority of those resources are, are not producing, uh, producing in cities but in the rural territory. And uh, in that sense, uh, what was saying, I don't remember, maybe Di Zhang uh, about the countryside and the relation, if, if maybe uh, the countryside will gain more freedom or, and will be independent uh, from cities or will be a contributor and, and continue sacrificing uh, for the city expanding. I will say uh, none of the. I will say none of none of those. Maybe the, the we of course we of course don't like to to mention the the word freedom. We we talk about territories, but if we trying to understand territories as free territories as uh, no dependent territories, is we we um, also. Uh, are not considering this this situation of the continuum, right? So, rural areas will not be free from cities, but cities will not be free from rural areas. Both will be connected, and this situation will increase during the coming decades. With more on each each day, cities will be more dependent. I will say the opposite: cities will be more dependent of rural areas than rural areas on cities. But of course, the reality will be that the population will come and will continue coming to cities. Um, and maybe the, the, the last point about the Sarah's uh, insight on what is the, the, the political action needed to the SDG achievement and maybe uh, what can be the technical role of, of, for instance, the academy and other local actors on sustainable development, I will say that um, not, also, no, not only SDGs, but also MDGs. Remember that SDGs uh, is an evolution from, S, from MDGs, which were the Millennium Development Goals adopted at the beginning of the millennium. Uh, that, wa that was also the first global commitment between 
eh, member states of the United Nations to achieve a similar and proportional condition of developments around the world. And this was always taught as a ge generational commitment and as a generational change. So that's why uh, neither the MDGs nor the SDGs has a, has a, a time frames from for five or for ten years. All of those have frames a time frame for 15, 20 or 30 years because they are understood as a gen generational commitment. So I think that in that sense, for instance, the role of academy is fundamental because if we from capacity buildings program from universities cannot train the new architects, the new practitioners, the new planners, the new politicians in the necessity of achieving not only the targets of the SDGs, but the necessity to change our paradigm about development. Remember that the lesson, the lesson that I showed you before was uh, SDGs are not important for having a, for having some targets. SDGs are important because they uh, propose a new paradigm for development, a new paradigm which is multidimensional, which is not based only on a consumption a consumption a, a practices, but also, of course, on responsibility, a, of course, on a environmental protection, of course, they are a, centered not only in economic growth and in people growth, but also in the relation of people with the planet and with the other a, species that inhabit on the planet. So I think that the role of, of universities, the role, the technical role for sustainable development is to train, is to change the paradigm of new practitioners, of new politicians, to overcome really uh, these global challenges and to try to, to implement new and sustainable models of development. Uh, I know that I, I probably uh, didn't reply any of the, of, the, of the questions, but I try to, to report and to propose more, more ideas for the debate. Thank you, Rafa. Yes. Uh... I have to say that uh, uh, the, appro the metropolitan dimension for us uh, is mostly an approach. Uh, it's, it's a matter of fact that uh, in a lot of uh, institutions, inside a lot of institutions, uh, they continue to speak about the metropolis as a conurbation. Otherwise, to consider metropoly as a proper phenomena, urban fact, uh, is uh, a leaping scale that allows us to understand that metropoly needs uh, a structure. And uh, um, I think that Rafa said something relevant. Metropoly needs a new social content that is uh, related to uh, and a new kind of metropolitan citizenship that need uh, symbols and uh, sign that we can, as architect and urban design, we can uh, uh, mark on the territory. So I really think that uh, as an approach that is not related to a definition, uh, we pass a lot of time uh, starting from Monteria event uh, and in a lot of other situations, trying to discuss what does it mean metropoli in Far East country or in Latin American country. At the end is the metropolitan dynamics uh, that we are facing and we try to uh, represent. So which kind of social content if architect and urban designer are not able to structure and to give a, a civic image to that uh, dimension. That means build, I don't want to say a metropolitan identity or a, a metropolitan genius logic, but a metropolitan uh, awareness. Um, that is something, and that approach, it's something that from my point of view is quite different from the 
Neil Brenner planetary urbanization because it's absolutely not um, generic. And so that is my question for Rafa. How is it possible um, to, to produce uh, in the frame of the metropolitan approach and using the SDGs tool, how is it possible to contextualize uh, the metropolitan approach? I mean, how is it possible to use this principle when we are working in Latin America or when we are working in the Far East? In Far East, for example, the metropolitan dimension is a matter of fact as the Desakota territory speaks about that uh, urban rural continuity. That is not uh, the same uh, in Latin America, for example, where nature is so uh, powerful that produce a very strong um, continuity. So is it possible to contextualize these SDGs according to the different character of the metropolis around the world from your point of view? I think that we need to, to there is also a question by Federico Misto. Maybe we can collect also his question. What do you think? Oh, yes, 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 please. Go ahead, Federico. Federico. Okay, thank you, Sara. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, yes, Rafa, I, I had a um, brief question because when you showed this uh, map of the metropolises all, all over the world, I was um, looking to the fact that Mm, the metropolis of Milan wasn't shown uh, as a more than 5 million inhabitant uh, metropolis, while, for example, Barcelona and Madrid were shown uh, as more than 5 million inhabitants metropolis. So I know that this is probably related to the fact of the uh, metropolis, you said, as a connected, uh, connected uh, net of cities that is surpassing the administrative boundaries, right? So um, we know that in Milan, the metropolitan area is limited in, in let's say, theoricamente, theoretically to the uh, metropolitan city of Milan. But actually, there is a conurbation that is bigger than the Barcelona and the Madrid area, as far as I know. And I know Barcelona and Madrid uh, quite well, more or less. So my question was, how in your work uh, in, in the UN Habitat and in Metro Hub, you face this, uh, this issue of the fact that the um, administrative boundaries and the, the administrations don't um, uh, collimate or are not the same as the real extension of the metropolis and the, the dynamics of the metropolis as also the professor continues saying. So we are we framed uh, this morning uh, the problem of Piacenza in relation with Milan, Bologna, and Genova and Turin also. So as a center point for all the conurbation of the north uh, um, of the north uh, Italian area, but actually they are belonging to different regions and uh, they are not. Uh, um, let's say, present in your, uh, in your uh, frame and uh, as uh, probably the metropolitan dynamics would suggest that they should be. So this was my, my question. How do you put in the, these different uh, things and these differences together to try to force the action uh, of the SDGs? Thanks. I will start with Federico. That is a problem of international comparisons. Uh, of course, that for, for having all these trends and uh, in, the, in the presentation, we will have also the, the link to the data booklet with all the details on the numbers and figures and, of course, the data set for all the population trends of all the almost 22,000 uh, metropolis that I showed. But uh, uh, I have to, to make a disclaimer, of course. This, this, this uh, standardization of information to make the comparisons, the international comparisons, uh, are based on 
on numbers, on, on national statistics that all the member states, that all the countries give to us. So, for instance, in the case of Barcelona that you mentioned, uh, it is very clear to me because I, I was a student in a, in a recent uh, past, uh, they have uh, 36 municipalities, which uh, sum uh, a total of 3.8 million people or so on, but you can see it in the map uh, like a metropolis of more than 5 million. That's why, uh, and, or, or uh, that is why the national government, the, the Spain government, uh, in their national census and in their national statistics, understand Barcelona as a, re a, a metropolitan region with more than 5 million people. So that, that numbers, they give us to us, to our population division, that numbers, and we base it, our analysis on that number. So our analysis are based on the official data of all uh, United Nations member states. Maybe, I am not sure, but may, maybe in the case of Milan, uh, the government of Italy give or understand Milan as a met metropolitan city with less than uh, 5 million, no? which is corresponding with the political administrative division and not with the territorial uh, definition. And uh, there is th that is a problem because uh, in different parts of the world, some governments can understand one definition and another governments understand another definition. So the international comparison is, is sometimes difficult. But uh, I can tell you that all, all, all these numbers, so need to be understood as minimal numbers. They maybe uh, could be bigger. So uh, we know that there are at least uh, or almost 2,000 metropolises uh, which represent 2.6 billion people around the world. But they are living numbers. They are growing every day. And maybe when we uh, achieve a better standardization of international comparison, we will have a more uh, uh, precise and, and exact uh, definitions and numbers. But for today, as for today, we need to, to deal with this kind of, of proxies and, and different uh, understandings of metropolises, which, which depend of national entities and national governments. Uh, and, and that's why also, I think that uh, the numbers serve us as, a, as an input, but uh, really we need to go uh, more deeper than the numbers. And, that, uh, and, and, and that's why it is important to, to also uh, understand the geography of the metropolis, right? As I said before, uh, you can have the number, but the important thing is understand that cities today are not being used as they were defined in the past. That is the that is the, 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 the main insight, and the principal insight. Uh, citizens today, and I refer to what Antonella was saying, citizens today uh, use this, this the, the different uh, local administrative boundaries with, with without caring about them. So all 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 days around the world, citizens are going from a municipality to another municipality even without noting it. And, and that is important and that is what we need to try to manage and to try to achieve. Uh, we need to manage territorial dynamics as they are connected and not and as they are political divided because at the end that, that doesn't care to the citizens, that doesn't care to the climate change, that doesn't care to the pandemic. So uh, in that sense, I think Antonella, that uh, for applying for applying this approach, this metropolitan approach to sustainable uh, development, we really need to care about management, the management of the territory. We cannot uh, apply this approach without the proper management tools. And that's why, for instance, our approach from UN Habitat is that we need at least some governance tools for that uh, connected realities, some planning tools, some legal frameworks, and some financing mechanisms, at least uh, that four categories. Because if we don't have planning instruments like plan, project programs, if we don't have governance systems on 
of government mechanisms as metropolitan institutions, councils, uh, co um, commissions. If we, if we don't have legal frameworks to, to really uh, take uh, in a more proper way the management of the, of the territory, and if we don't know have uh, uh, financing mechanisms, we cannot manage that, that connected uh, reality. So uh, for what we need to apply the, the, the metropolitan approach to the sustainable development, we really need tools. We really need tools. We, need, we really need tools uh, uh, related with territorial management. And again, I think that universities and that uh, uh, capacity building programs have a fundamental role to play there because it is the it is the, the, the proper scenary to train the new practitioners in in those tools uh, and and i think that if we uh, finish it uh, this course this summer school uh, given to the practitioners some of that uh, of those tools and and uh, teaching to to how to apply them uh, we will we will uh, have an interesting advance in that regard. Thank you. Well, uh, if, you if you agree, I guess, with this uh, suggestion and, uh, and input and uh, push by Rafa, I guess uh, we can also close. What do you think about it? I think that it was a very long journey today. We got the point with this uh, last words by Rafa, I guess. <laughs> Yes, and uh, during the summer school, we will have a, a other occasion to to go deep into some tools related to other uh, to the real territorialization uh, of the SDGs and some practical key studies. So we also can learn how is it possible to go down into a, a real project uh, um, using this um, using these tools and uh, and the approach to complexity that is for us uh, the the main reason uh, to 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 apply uh, the and and to work considering uh, the, the the metropolitan dynamic uh, has something that we can found uh, all over the world, uh, even at a very small uh, scale. So thank you very much, Rafa. Uh, we promise that we will send to Metro Hub Initiative uh, also the final result uh, of this uh, summer school. I hope that when you have time, you would like to join us uh, also during the other lecture of your colleagues. We will send you the calendar and all the information. The link is the same. And uh, we really hope to see in presence very soon. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much for joining us this night. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to you, thank Antonella, you. Sara, and Michelle, all thank you. This was very interesting for me. I also learned a couple of things that I think that is the idea, right? Not only that the participants learn from us, but also us learning from them. And, and please, of course, uh, send me the, the final result of the, of the workshops, and I will be very curious to, to check them and maybe to, to find opportunities to use them. Uh, and also, I will try, of course, to connect to another uh, lectures of my colleagues. I will. I my my best try for do it and remember this this is my my last uh, insight and my last call um, one of the things that that we learned from the pandemic and that i think that this caused the difference is that no city alone no country alone can address the the challenges of sustainable development we really need a uh, new approaches based on cooperation on integration on solidarity and especially on collective action. And I think that all those elements are at the core of the metropolitan approaches. So uh, thank you. Thank you all for being here. And for, for I think, I, I know that it's late uh, to you. So have a good night and I uh, hope to see you very soon. Bye-bye. Ciao. Bye. Grazie. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Have a good night and goodbye. Ciao. Bye. We meet tomorrow. Ciao. Bye-bye.